the Rothschilds, right? And, okay, and Babylonian, Nimrod, all that. Um, but this is the Illuminati you're talking about, right? Well, I mean, you know, you can call it Illuminati or you can call it the King's Court. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's a lot of problems people have with semantics, right? So, for example, if you talk about Freemasons and Illuminati, and Illuminati, a lot of people say, oh, that crazy stuff was sorted with, you know, that's associated with reptiles and funky UFO things, right? Mm -hmm. And their minds shut. But if you tell them, no, no, it's like a plutocracy and aristocracy, uh, then they don't have these associations that have been put in their brains and they can absorb the information. But so, so but again, if we talk about the, uh, you know, I, so I started looking up how the ancient Sumerian society was managed. And you'll find that it's really quite similar to its to modern United States. Um, you know, in Japan, they used to call the finance ministry the big warehouse ministry. But in the old days, you would have a whole bunch of people who did not grow their own food anymore, right? You have these surpluses. So they'd store this extra wheat in big warehouses. And it would be the high priests who would control the distribution of the food to the masses. And this is now what we call central bankers. But behind the high priests was a king who had godlike powers. And he, they created the story that this, there was a god who could see and know everything. And it was an abstract one. Uh, so it existed in parallel with a real guy with a beard on a throne who had godlike powers. So this is a system that still exists. Mm -hmm. uh, and remember, if you control the food supply, right, then you can hire warriors and intellectuals uh, and control society, control their thinking, control their food, and control them through violence if necessary. And that's how it works even now. That's why it's so important to understand that finance is control over your food supply, control over your and energy supply. Would you want energy to say supply. Nowadays? Yes. I mean, uh, when at the bottom of the day, at the end of the day, it's food. Without so, it, you die. Okay, and, and, and basically you keep people busy by sending them to war. Well, right? okay, I mean, um, if we fast forward, I think that, now, the, the Rothschilds, you know, as a Canadian, I was, kind of, I was always kind of proud of the War, the war of 1812 thought, hey, this little Canada managed to hold off the United States. But apparently what happened was that in 1812, the American Republic decided not to renew Rothschild's banking license. And the American people took control of their own money. And that's why Rothschild invaded the United States. And that was the real reason for the War of 1812. So that's why you have in your anthem, oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early? It's a, a flag in a fort that survived a British attack. Um, so, you know, a lot of our history was hidden, but f for the next century, the Rothschilds plotted and schemed to get back control of the United States money supply and therefore the American people. Now, the reason they wanted to do this, I mean, I do believe they had their ideals, you know. Um, they got the best and the brightest, and they would debate, you know, how to do the greatest good for the greatest number. I think it was a quite enlightened uh, and liberal aspects to what they did. I mean, if you just look at how the societies like Holland, Canada, you know, and stuff that were under their control, you can see they're really quite nice places for all sorts of different levels of people. Um, but what happened, I mean, this is how I analyze the situation now, is that to take over control of the United States, they tried many things. I think they engineered the Civil War. But they got Carnegie, Harriman to control the railroads and the steel production. And the way they did it was they would l lend them the money. But they would lend it in such a way that eventually 
they would have to give it the, the railway to the Rothschilds. That was a very clever scheme. But um, we have, I think, was it William Avery Rockefeller was a horse thief and a seller of, you know, fake medicine. And this was according to Pulitzer's newspaper, who I think they had a big expose on the father of John Rockefeller the first. But, but John Rockefeller the first was into oil. And he would buy the refineries. He would come up to a guy with an oil refinery and offer him cash at a low price. And if the man refused to sell, he'd cause problems with the uh, workers or maybe sabotage, or whatever necessary. <coughs> and the Rothschilds took note of this uh, Rockefeller guy and they decided they'd help him. And they would, they would allow him to transport his oil at much cheaper rates than all his competitors. So he got the oil monopoly. Mm -hmm. And I think most people know about this now, but in 1913, Finally, the Rockefellers, the Harrimans, the Warburgs, this group of families were able to take over the Federal Reserve Board, supposedly on behalf of Rothschild. But I do believe that Rockefeller staged a sort of coup d'etat and said, hey, I control the American army and I control the American economy and uh, so I'll, you know, I'll cooperate with you, but I'm in charge here. And he took over the United States. So I think it became a Rockefeller fief, not a Rothschild one. They okay. meet and they cooperate. Right. So to this day, you feel that there's a cooperation? I think there is some cooperation. I think there's also conflict. Um, you can see this in the, for example, pattern of UN resolutions. For example, the Europeans have consistently voted for uh, Israel to solve its problem with the Palestinians on, based on something like the 1967 UN agreements, you know, with some modifications. And it's the Americans and the Israelis who had a very, who always vetoed all sorts of different things. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the pattern of European versus American voting, in the UN, you can see the difference between the two sides. Right. Um, so where does Japan fall in this group? Okay. Now, in Japan, what happened was, after Admiral Perry came, uh, Lord Rothschild sent a fleet, and they attacked the Satsuma and Choshu clans in the south. And they had the Kenmu Emperor murdered, and they installed a 16-year-old boy by the name of Toranosuke Omura as the Meiji Emperor, and they financed the modernization of Japan. So they set up the royal family, uh, the emperor in power, and they helped him modernize Japan, and they fought the Russians. And I think um, the Japanese were very grateful, and in 1903, after the victory, um, you know, the Japanese emperors were made part of British royalty. They're given, you know, and they, every emperor goes to Oxford to study. But I think that after World War II, the Japanese started to get disillusioned because they were not treated as equals. They were not given what they felt a fair deal. They felt there was racism. And that and this was the essential reason why the British Empire never became a real world empire. It was because they would take some very intelligent Indian gentleman, educate him at Oxford, and give him the highest levels of knowledge. But at the end of the day, they'd say, well, you're a wog. You're a bloody wog, so you're just going to have to work for us. If they had made it possible for someone like Gandhi to be the head of the entire British Empire, in other words, let them in, let them join the upper ranks, they would still be in control of the planet to this day. But because they're saying essentially, you know, at the very top, it's a white man's club and you guys are just high level servants. Well, they alienated them. Um, okay, but how does this relate to World War II and, and you know, the whole, I mean, okay, the Americans so, eventually, if you're saying Rockefeller helped the Japanese up to a point. No, no, I'm saying happened? Rothschild helped the Japanese. Okay, okay Rothschild. But, in the 1930s, the Japanese made a break for independence. 
they wanted to set up the Southeast Asia co-prosperity theory. They wanted to modernize all the yellow countries so that they could stop colonization by the whites. That's how they looked at it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the Japanese are an island people and they're not very good at um, uh, relations. But what you also have to realize is that history is written by the winners. And so uh, the reason the Japanese were able to take over most of China and were only stopped by U.S. invasion uh, was because a lot of Chinese actually welcomed them. This is something that you don't read in your history books. But they, there was, it was just an attempt by the Asians to prevent uh, being colonized. They look at Europeans as like the Borg in Star Trek. Only one way of thinking is correct. If you imagine this giant pyramid of a society with its eye at the top, and you will be assimilated, you know, resistance is futile. I mean, that's how they look at us. And there's something to it. There is a sense that if it's not done the Western way, it's wrong. Uh, the good example is the pachinko. I mean, it, they do have a gambling, and it does work, but it's not within the Western-style legal framework. It's in a separate framework. The same way with the bureaucrats. They decide the law. Uh, and that's a, a more living, fast-reacting system than, you know, using endless courtroom battles. I mean, Americans are, you know, at 4% of the world population, 20-some percent of world GDP, but 50% of the world's lawyers and 50% of the world's military expenditures. So, you know, a lot too much time spent arguing and fighting, as far as the Asians are concerned. <laughs> you know. So you got to remember, they, they look at things very differently. It takes a long time to understand their perspective. Okay, so, but you wrote a book about Rockefeller and how he, his role. Okay, what happened was, okay, once I started to understand all this, and I realized that, okay, after World War II ended, it, you know, control went of Japan went from the Rothschilds to the Rockefellers. And at first they said to the Japanese, you just go ahead and develop your economy any way you want, rebuild your economy, and as long as you're militarily allied to the U.S., that's all we care about, right? Um, until the 1980s, when Japan had these huge trade surpluses, and this made them very, very nervous. And I now realize why. It's because they got, they had won World War III without fighting, without firing a single shot, because they had managed to control most of the world's financial assets. And money is power. If you have that money, you can hire the soldiers, you can hire the intellectuals, you can... So how are you saying sell. Japan did this? By working hard and generating trade surpluses. Okay, so the electronics? Electronics, cars, uh, you know, nice products that people want to buy. Right. Um, and, you know, they were, well, I mean, they had the control of the money. And, and the, this is where they started to get worried. And they, they set out to kind of put the Japanese back in their place. And they managed to get them with this bubble, which was, you know, basically on U.S. orders. They said, uh, first of all, they said, okay, we want you to raise your yen. Right? Because they were trying to... They, they didn't want the Japanese to have control of the money. So they said to them at first, okay, make, you know, and the yen went from 360 to the dollar to at one point 79 to the dollar. But all that happened was the Japanese moved their industrial base to China and Southeast Asia and got them rich, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that didn't work. So finally, what they, they were doing was they were bullying and killing Japanese politicians. Who was? The Rockefellers, I would say, at the end of the day. In order to make sure they never were presumptuous enough to use their money the way they wanted to, but rather just hand it to the Americans. And I still haven't checked this out, but I'm pretty sure if you add up all the Japanese trade surpluses and the numbers, and then compare it to what's now officially recognized as Japanese assets, you'll find that the trade surpluses are much bigger. In other words, it's like 
you go to a bar and you say, put it on my tab. And then after a few years, you say, well, look, you know, forget about half my tab. Just, let's, you know, forget about it. And so the idea is that we'll just, we'll keep taking money from you forever. Uh, it's like tribute payments to the Roman Empire. They send cars and they send TVs and they get nothing back except paper. This is how they look at it. And it's right. For 30, 40 years, the Americans have been getting stuff from all over the world and not paying for it. Why have the Japanese then tolerated that for so long? In your opinion? Well, um, first of all, after World War II, they truly and genuinely fell in love with the United States. You know, they were told they were going to be tortured and stuff. I remember this guy shivering in fear, you know, after war, an American soldier was coming. And, and thinking they're going to torture him, what are they going to do? And the guy gives him a Hershey bar, right? And this is symbolic of, I mean, they were, they were really well treated. And, um, and up until the fall of the Soviet Union, they also really felt that they needed the Americans to protect them. And they have created this illusion of fear, right? If you don't have us, you're going to be conquered. But the other thing is that they've been subjected to very intense propaganda since the end of World War II. There was a Dr. Funai, well-known guy here in Japan, who had a senior American officer stay in his house after World War II. And the officer said to him, we're going to change your education system so that you don't get any more geniuses. Uh, and they did. There were, the, the propaganda the Japanese have been subjected to is that, first of all, they've been given an inferiority complex. Second, they've been told that America is a wonderful country. And third, they've been told that without American protection, they're doomed. And they've been deliberately, their education has been dumbed down so they, they don't know how to argue. They don't know how to debate. They're being trained not to have opinions. But isn't this also part of the Oriental mindset that they, even the emperors, kind of push down to the people? Um, there is something to the traditional Confucian model, right? But, uh, but the traditional Confucian model, the, the, the key is that the people at the top have to be true models of modest behavior. I mean, they have to be very morally upright and treat their country like their family, like their kids, and, mm -hmm. and be nice to them. So that's the, the philosophy. It's not just one of blind obedience to a tyrant, but rather, ideally, it's like a generous and gentle father figure, which is what they aspire to. So what you see in North Korea is a, is a remnant. When you saw what the Maoist thing of this traditional sort of kingship system of Asia, um, but right. So there's a built-in you know respect for power and authority and figures yeah. on on top, thinking that they are beneficent. Yes. But that's a, a naivete. I mean, at the same time, I mean, your explanation has to be a little bit simplistic in terms of why they would accept this kind of like dumbing down, as you call it, of Japanese society across the board. Like, what was in it for them? Well, they got, first of all, uh, the way to enslave a person is you beat the hell out of them, and then you be really nice to them. And it's like saying, hey, you know, if you do what I say, I'll be really nice to you, treat you well. But remember, if you don't, that's what those nuclear bombs were about. Okay. Um, but also, I mean, the Japanese were able to develop their economy. They were left alone, you know, um, for a long time. It's only in recent years that it's become kind of, uh, you know, really bad, noxious. Okay, it's, it's this, there's an illness at the heart of the American system. And what it boils down to is if you look at, inter at financial flows, okay, Money has been going from the poor countries to the rich countries. And within the rich countries, it's been going from the poor to the rich. And it's like a giant sponge sucking up all human life energy. And the poorest people on the planet, you know, they're forced by agribusiness and other things to, to the lowest level. And the only thing they can do is hit on something even lower, the poor little weak creatures. 
They have to burn down forests to make new farmland because they've used up their farmland and they don't get access to fertilizer. So they have to, you know, ravage the planet. So the, the source of poverty and environmental problems in the world is the people who own the Federal Reserve Board and their policies of prioritizing the rich and everything to the rich. And that is the essence of the problem. And the Japanese have had their savings stolen from them and they've been forced to adopt economic policies that have increased poverty here. The so-called reforms that Koizumi, Prime Minister Koizumi and Heizo Takanaka were forced by the Americans through blackmail to impose on the Japanese have meant that a, a recent survey by the Asahi newspaper shows that the amount of people who think their lives have gotten worse since these reforms began is more than double the amount of people who think it got better. Uh, they have created a society split between the very rich and the poor. American society is also the same. Mm -hmm. American uh, male workers' salaries peaked in 1973, and they've been falling ever since. So if you look at the medium, the, the, the gross mean product, in other words, the level at which half the people are below and half the people are above, you find it's very close to the poverty line. Um, they've been taking money. It's really just too much money has been going to the rich, and they haven't had proper ways to spend it. And they've been deluded into thinking that the problem with the environment is too many brown people burning down forests, and so the answer is to get rid of them. And they have been manufacturing diseases. Uh, the, there is solid evidence that AIDS, HIV, was made by the U.S. military as a bioweapon against Africans. Mm -hmm. um, and what about SARS? SARS is a bioweapon that targets a specific gene that is very prevalent among Asians but almost never found among Caucasians. So it's a race-specific bioweapon. Mm -hmm. And so, so let's get down to this whole association you had with the Yakuza on okay. one hand, Chinese secret so, society. All right, yeah, all right. So um, th this is, as I start to understand how things really worked, and my understanding of news events became very different because I could merge the two, the conspiracy world and the Wall Street Journal world, right, into one. Right. Um, I got an opportunity to interview Heizo Takenaka last year, this spring, and I confronted him with a lot of evidence. In 2003, in February, I believe, he told Newsweek magazine that no bank was too big to fail. And he imposed some arcane uh, economic rules that forced the companies to sell their cross shareholdings. In other words, the banks and the companies used to own each other's shares, so no outsider could come in and make a hostile takeover. And he forced the companies to sell their bank shares. And he put out that no bank was too big to fail, and everyone thought that meant that the bank shares would be worth nothing. It's like I say, I'll sell you my wallet. There's no money in it, but there's bills. And if you buy it, you have to pay the bills. Well, nobody's going to buy it except you tell your friends, hey, listen, I'm going to put 2.3 trillion yen of taxpayer money in that wallet later, so it's a bargain, right? So what happened was the, the stock price of the banks plummeted in 2003. And if you look at who bought it, you'll find that it's bought by uh, foreigners, State Street and Banking, Chase Manhattan, Citibank. In other words, a group of financial institutions that are controlled by these charitable foundations that are in contern, controlled either by the Rothschilds or the Rockefellers. I mean, the Rock, well, these families. I, I, I use Rockefeller as an abbreviation for this group of inbred aristocratic families, the American side versus the European side. Um, right. But, I mean, the Bushes are part of it, for example. Uh, so you can actually see in, in the financial data and what happened was the president of Risona Bank did not want to sell his bank to these foreigners. And they have a, over a 33% share, which is what gives them control and interest. And he also 
sold the postal savings. And it was sort of like a, you know, gangster husband saying to his wife, hey, come on, give me more money. He said, I've got no more. Hey, what about that postal bank? You've still got that. Give it to me. You know, that's what it boils down to. But anyway, getting back to Risona, the president didn't want to hand over his shares, unlike the other banks. They all meekly compl complied. And so what happened was, he said, hey, I'm not bankrupt. I don't, you know. And so his accountant, the accountant in charge of Risona, died in mysterious circumstances. We still don't know if it was suicide or a murder. And suddenly, the accounts showed that they were bankrupt. And at the time, ruling party politicians were saying, if you've got even $100,000, $200,000, buy Rishona shares. It's going to be a big deal. And then there was a professor at Waseda University by the name of Uexa, who was starting to say, hey, you know, something very fishy going on about Rishona. And he was arrested in Yokohama for looking at a girl's underwear with a mirror. No, the, the woman in, in, uh, in question never actually filed a complaint, but never mind. He was fired from his job, taken off his TV shows. Um, I was also blacklisted around that time. I was taken off a lot of TV shows. They said, you're on a blacklist, Mr. Fulford. We can't put you on the show anymore. Why? Because, I, you know, like, like him and like other guys were pointing out the, the BS about these so-called economic reforms. And they didn't want people to know what was really going on. But anyway, a Mr. Ota from the tax department also started investigating Risona for tax evasion and stuff. And he, and he was arrested in Yokohama for looking at girls' underwear with a mirror. And then Mr. Suzuki from the Asahi newspaper, who had a big scoop years ago with the recruit scandal, put out on December 17th, year before last, an article saying that Risona was giving 10 times more donations to the ruling party than other banks and that there was a suspicion of insider trading. It was, it was supposed to be part of an investigative series. That night, they found his body in Yokohama Bay. Okay? So I confronted Mr. Tanaka, Takenaka with all this information. I have it on video. Uh, I have not released the video because Mr. Takenaka has talked telling me that uh, he was forced to do it because the United States threatened to hit Japan with HARP, H-A-A-R-P, if they didn't, okay? Okay, and what would have been the impact of that? I mean, what, tell us what, what that meant to Japan. Earthquakes. Okay. Um, we'll get into that more, because I know that this starts getting into really esoteric, so it's almost mind-boggling, you know? Yeah. I mean, I had a lot of trouble wrapping my mind around this stuff for a long time. After I interviewed Takenaka, I got an email from someone at the Japan Development Bank, who's a disciple of Mr. Takenaka's. And he said to me, uh, there's someone, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Takenaka would like you to meet. And I have the copies of the original emails, too. And so I go to a Shinjuku hotel room, and I meet a man wearing a fancy silk kimono. Okay, I have a photograph of him, and I have a tape recording of this conversation, okay? Um, and he had two rings. One was a mask of a devil with horns. And the other looked like a wedding ring. And you go like this, and there is a Freemason mark. And he, he says to the, he says these horns, he could put a little bit of poison on him, touch me, and I'd be dead. And he tells me he's a ninja, which is a professional assassin. And I, you know, I, uh... And the guy looks very different from the average Japanese. He's a member of the Sanka mountain people. They're like the Ainu. They're sort of like maybe the Japanese equivalent of an Apache. Mm -hmm. Very warlike. They're used by Japanese special forces. Mm -hmm. And he says to me, Mr. Fulford, if you want to be, you know, a muckraking journalist, go ahead and do so. But you will die at age 46. However, and he gives me a big Freemason badge. It says, if you don't, the other choice is you can become finance minister of Japan. Okay? So he's offering me a choice between death and the job of finance minister. And again, I have this on tape. I have the email trail. I have the video of my interview with Takanaka. Okay? So it's weird stuff, but I have the proof. Anyway, I thought that I would have no choice but to go along. But I had been reading about, you know, population reduction plans. 
And so I asked them, is it true? And I have this on tape too. He says, yes, you know, we have to, in order to protect the environment, we need to reduce the world population to 2 billion. And war just doesn't do it, so we're going to try to use disease and starvation. Who told you this? The self-described ninja sent by Takenaka. Right? And, um, you know, I'd already found out that SARS was a bioweapon targeted at Asians. Uh, so this is very disturbing. So these are talking about killing 4 billion people. Right? So they're offering me the job of, and, and he said to me, look, we're going to, you know, we're taking money from the Japanese, but we're not, you know, t cutting out their flesh or their bones, you know. We're just skimming off the fat, right? But that's how he described it. So, you know, we're, we're, we're looting these people's money, but we're not going to kill them, you know. And he said the population in Japan would be reduced to 70 million. But they would allow 70 million to live. And they need about 500 million Asians to keep making toys and stuff. You know, so he's describing, you know, massive genocide. Okay? Again, I have it on tape. I can prove this, was ma this man was sent to me by Takanaka. Um, so the very next day, okay, again. Well, what did you say to this guy? I just, I'm just curious. I mean, <laughs> did you say yes or at that point? Or did you say, let me think about it? And he said, okay, or? Yeah, I just thought, well, you know, it was all too, you know, overwhelming. I didn't give any clear answer, but I thought maybe I'd have to, I have no choice but to go along with these guys and try to do something from the inside to stop them, right? Mm -hmm. But I guess a lot of people at the very elite, I'm sure it happens, Mr. Obama and Clinton and anybody else at the high level of U.S. politics, that they're someday, or, or, you know, senators, whatever, they're given the same kind of ultimatum, death or cooperation. So either you join us, or you die. And that's how they managed to control the United States and enslave the American people by capturing their very top elite mm -hmm. and forcing them to go along with a combination of bribes and Okay, when you say threats. they, who's they? Well, uh, this is what you'd call the Council for Relations, Bilderberg. Um, now, the Trilateral Commission comes up, but that's not got any power because the Trilateral Commission was set up by the Rockefellers because the Bilderberg were too racist to let the Japanese in. So it was made as a forum for the Japanese to have their say. But what happened was, and at first, some very high-level Japanese joined, okay? You have, like, prime ministers and stuff in there. But... The Japanese say, well, hey, they didn't listen to us. I've talked to many members of the Trilateral Commission, right? So now you have, as the head of the Japanese side, as the president of Fuji, Xerox, which is, you know, before they had people like Prime Minister Miyazawa, right? So it's a big drop. It's like, you know, the Japanese say, to hell with your Trilateral Commission, essentially, because you don't even listen to us. It's, it's a not So anyway, what I'm saying is, uh, it's the families that own the Federal Reserve Board and all their hired hands. They have so, the money. So Takanaka's guy, okay, that comes to you makes this offer to be a Freemason is sent by who at the top? Well, Takanaka was a disciple of Henry Kissinger's. And Henry Kissinger worked for David Rockefeller. And I had accused Takanaka of selling the Japanese financial system to Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically, if you're like, imagine a video game, right? A pyramid, right? And the, 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 the first step in the pyramid is Boy Scouts, right? Mm -hmm. And about the fourth step is Rotary Club. And you keep rising up. Well, I was getting right to the top level. Because they told me, when they offered me to join the Freemasons, they said, look, uh, above the 33rd level, there's 13 levels. Okay. And remember the U.S. dollar bill, the pyramid on top. The I, that represents the people who, who set the human race to the job of pyramid building. So you see it's an unfinished pyramid. Okay? So above the 33rd step, there's 13 steps. And this is the inner group of about 10,000 people who control the West. And I would say a lot of them are very decent people who really wish to do good things and did not wish to find themselves within those ranks but had no choice. So I'd be willing to say that the majority of the people in that elite group uh, 
are good people with good hearts who want to do good things for the planet and, and uh, find themselves in this hidden king's court. So these, okay, so you got this offer. All right. What did you do ne next? Well, what happened was the very next day, I got a call from a movie director, a Japanese movie director, and he says to me, I want to talk to you about something. So I met him, and he, and he said, there's someone I want you to meet. So I went to a, another hotel room, right? They seem to like hotel rooms, you know, when they want us to talk about important stuff. Um, and again, I recorded this, so I'll never release this recording. The guy tells me that he represents a Asian secret society and that they have 6 million members, including 1.8 million gangsters and 100,000 professional assassins. Now, as you I recall, I did tell you I had a degree in Asian studies with a China area specialty. So I had read about this society in the history books. I knew about them. It's the red and the green. Um, what happened was when the the Ming Empire was like the the Ming Empire was like the high point of Chinese civilization. You find that the Ming ceramics, the Ming art, everything is at like the highest level. Mm -hmm. It was really an idyllic society, and they look back at it with you know a lot of fondness. And there was a general guarding the northern uh, border against the Manchus, and they he was very much in love with his wife, and they kidnapped his wife. They said, "If you want your wife back, you're going to have to let us through the gates," and he did. Uh, and the Ming Emperor fell, the Ming Empire fell, and the Ming Army became an underground organization, and the Ming Navy. Okay, so the red and the blue are the army and the navy, and the blue also is the bureaucracy. So the 1.8 million are gangsters, the other 4.2 million are intellectuals, PhDs, like the really smartest people. Um, and their plan was to overthrow the Qing, the Manchus, excuse me, and restore the Ming. Now they were responsible for the Boxer Rebellion, which was against the use of opium, among other things. And this is very interesting because the people selling the opium were skull and bones. So they've been fighting this Western secret society since the 1800s, at least. Okay, but wasn't it the British that in introduced opium? Um, well, it was the British too, to but China. I mean, if you look at the skull and bones, you'll find there are slave traders and opium runners, the so-called China trade. Okay. So, uh, it was both. Okay. So you're, you're, in, you're in this hotel room, and, and, and now you understand the background between what he's asking you and saying what he, where he... Well, they're saying they offered, they'd like to offer their assistance to me. Because I'd, I'd written in a book about SARS being a bioweapon and these people are trying to kill you and you've got to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Um, at first, I mean, this is all happening in one week, right? This is <laughs> totally, you know, out of the normal parameter type of stuff that's going on. So mm -hmm. it took me a while to digest. It's, you know, the first thing I thought was, well, geez, you know, you could play like a, a 911 videos in Chinatown or something. But I said, look, let me get back to you. Let me think about this. And I spent about a month thinking about it. And I had this great, what I call my Kill Bill moment. You know, there's a scene in the movie Kill Bill, these two women fighting with swords. It looks like it's going to be a long, nasty fight. Right. It's not going to be sure who's the winner, right? Yes. And, but one of the women, the bad one, has, a, has a one eye missing. She has a patch. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, she grabs the eye and yes, blinds her and ends the fight. unbelievable, yeah. Very, very graphic. Very, very graphic, but I thought, hey, why not just target the eye of the pyramid? Because most Westerners don't even know it exists. Um... They're so scared at the top, I mean, they, and they, they kill so many people so frequently that they're terrified, they, and it's very secret. It has been until the internet came about. Uh, you know, nobody knew about this. I certainly wouldn't have believed it uh, if I didn't run into it firsthand. Uh, but, you know, then I found the, the evidence trail. Again, you follow the, these foundations and who controls them. You'll see that the Rockefellers control about $10 trillion worth of stuff. But anyway, uh, I realized the society has six million members, 
and the western secret side, the top is only 10,000. So it's 6 million against 10,000. So suddenly I said, well, that's it. Isn't it? We can, we can, we've got these bastards. Uh, you know, but, and that's when I started writing the stuff on rents and, and, you know, making. So, okay, so you must have gone back to this group, which, yeah, what do well, you call I, this group now? Because they're a group of Yakuza and Chinese it's the, it's society. The, do it's they have the, a name? The red and the blue. The red and the blue. Societies. And, and, and you must have joined them because you're not dead. Yeah, and, well, I, I went to meet all their big bosses. In and China or, or? In Taiwan. Oh, yeah. Um, and I joined. I became the first Westerner in 500 years to join. And then Rockefeller or, I don't know if you want to say Rockefeller, but whoever the Freemasons, the head of the Freemasons, had to leave you alone at that point? Well, I mean, what they, the Chinese or the Asians said is, look, we won't make the first move. But what happened was, I started writing stuff about Takanaka and Rockefeller. And I got death threats from this ninja, you know, just saying, you know, Ultraman, you're running out of time, your red light's beaming. You know, it's people who think they're, don't gonna, they're not going to die are the ones who end up in Yokohama Bay. You know, lots of, I have the emails, I have copies of these death threats. So Did I, you have a, body, a bodyguard at that point? Did you hire someone? No. Look, no? if you need a bodyguard, it's too late. Oh. You have to operate at a higher level. I mean, if they really want to shoot me, they're going to shoot me. Uh, you have to make them not want to shoot you. That's the trick. Okay, and now, because you joined this group, and because the odds, I mean, that made big news when you kind of came out about that. Um, but what happened was, I sent an email saying, hey, look, if you kill me, then every member of the Rockefeller, Rothschild, Schiff, etc. families will die. I mean, there are, you know, there's 600 assassins for every one of them if we want to, right? But, I mean, we want them killed, they can all be killed, right? But... We understood that to be the majestic, uh, the group, what we call uh, the ma Committee of the Majority. They were, in essence, the ones that were threatened. Is this yeah. your understanding? I mean, th that was the original idea, but what's happened since then is that I've been trying to get a more accurate picture of what's going on. And I've, I finally narrowed it down to the standard, the people who control the standard oil monopoly and the people who control the Fed. They are the source of the problem. Um, the oil monopoly the Americans think that's the key to their geopolitical power, is control over oil. Mm -hmm. But they've lost that control because Putin kicked them out of Russia. They don't control Iran. Maybe they do. I don't know about that. I, I think Ahmadinejad and Bush may be working for the same team. But anyway, I'm not sure on that one. But Venezuela is also free. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they, they're losing their oil monopoly. And the other thing that's happened is that they no longer have, theoretically, the military ability to take on the rest of the world. Okay, the United States Army cannot defeat China. They've done many different exercises, and every time the Americans lose. The bottom line is the Chinese people are prepared to fight and win a nuclear war. They can put their entire population underground and hit the U.S. with 300 missiles and wipe out every city in the U.S. The Americans can wipe out the surface of China, but it will be underground. So, they no longer, and then they can sink their aircraft carriers and shoot down their uh, satellites. So, it's no longer possible to militarily beat them. So the what only you're choice saying... for the Pentagon, and they know this, is to get soft power. And to do that, they need Japanese money to finance a campaign to end poverty and stop environmental destruction. And that's the proposal I made. I mean, I, my, plan, I, my mission is to come up with a win-win solution for everybody. Uh, the best way to prevent yourself from being killed is not to make enemies. And so I don't want to make enemies. I'm trying to make everybody happy. Okay, but you're basically taking what I thought were sort of age-old enemies, which is the Chinese and the Japanese, and they're banding together. To fight what is the Rockefellers and, and the, the people that own Well, when, they, when they create biological weapons that kill Asians, 
well, they have a common enemy. Yeah, I mean, look, when they're, they're trying to kill us. What are we going right. to do? They unite, and in this society, like I say, the um, if we get back to their history, the Meiji Emperor helped them overthrow the Qing and install the Sun Yat-sen mm -hmm. uh, as the president of China, the Republic of China, and so they together helped liberate China. And during the World War, uh, World War II, this society in Japan and other Asian countries all worked in concert. So it's a, it goes all across Asia. And the uh, Chairman Mao was financed by the Soviets, who were a Rothschild subsidiary. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the Green and the Red Gang, they last appeared in history books in 1949, fighting the communists in Shanghai. And then they disappeared. They went underground again. But in 1967, they kicked out the Illuminati from China. That's why they had a big Soviet-China split, why the Soviet Union and China nearly went to nuclear war. And the, Ch the Chinese had secretly prepared. They built these huge underground cities to prepare for a nuclear war. They had their nuclear weapons, and that's when they kicked them out. And China became independent again from these Western you know, central banking uh, families. Okay, so where does HARP fit in? Tell us about that. Okay. When I published some essays on the internet about Rockefeller mm -hmm. and the Illuminati, the secret history of the Illuminati, I got a call from this ninja guy. He says, oh boy, you've now done it. Now there's going to be an earthquake in Niigata. The Americans are going to use their earthquake machine. And boom, next day, two identical 6.8 earthquakes on Japan's biggest nuclear reactor right. happened. And this is what Takenaka had told me. So the reason I had to hand over the financial system was because they threatened us with their earthquake machine. Mm -hmm. Imagine that, an ally that's been financing your army, and you hit their nuclear reaction, the reactor with an earthquake machine? I mean, what sort of way is that to treat a friend? Um, you know. So, okay, well, let's get, let's get down to it. So, if that's what they have, then how, how are these secret societies claiming to fight well, you cannot, a machine like that? You, you because cannot, you're talking about scalar weaponry, and you, I'm sure you know that. You, you cannot stop an earthquake, uh, you cannot stop an assassination with an earthquake machine, you know? Um, Western people don't know about these, their leaders, the true leaders. So all you got to do is assassinate them all. You <laughs> cannot prevent that with an earthquake machine. That's the point of targeting the eye. But more to the point is you make them a more generous offer. Uh, so what I'm saying to the people in the Pentagon is that you have the job of saving the planet and you get even more money than now. I mean, think about it. They spent $600 billion, you know, to steal oil from Iraqis and, and uh, pipeline rights from Afghanis, with $600 billion, they could have a man on Mars. They could have a base on Mars by now. Mm -hmm. So we'll give them even more money than they're getting from these idiots who control the oil. But if they print money, why do they need money? Well, y you know, here's the trick, okay? And this is why it's falling apart this year, is that they've... Since World War II, they've basically said to countries, okay, here's the oil you're allowed to have, and here's your dollars, right? And, they, and the, the backing of the dollar was control over oil and control over a huge military machine, a threat of violence. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, there's $53 trillion in circulation, and again, the U.S. government owes $66 trillion to its own people. So, but the United States needs to borrow something like a trillion dollars a year now, just to keep going. And they've been doing it for 40 years, so they're basically bankrupt. When if you earn $13,000 a year and you have 120000 in debt, and they say, well, it's time to pay back, well, what can you do? Can they threaten violence? No, because what I just, you know, if it really came to it, the Americans would lose. So they can no longer use their threat of violence and they've lost their oil monopoly so that's it 
right? So if you're in the Pentagon, you're thinking, well, geez, you know, the only thing we can do now to save the day is to get all the non-Asian peoples on our side. And the way you do that is you be nice. You fight poverty and save the environment. You know, help to save the planet. That's the, you know, so I'm offering them a way out. What would happen is the, you replace the dollar with a new currency. And it may be necessary to have some kind of global currency, but not as these guys have been planning, controlled in secret by a secret elite. It has to be controlled by the people. Remember that. The key to democracy is control over money by the people not by a secret elite. It's the money that counts. If you lose control over your money, hand it over to people you can't see, you're a slave. It's, that's what you have to remember. Never ever again let some secret power elite take control of your money away from you. That's the key. It's people work for money.